Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Everybody tonight, light. So glad you could join with us today, and um, especially today because it's a it's an incredible show. But first, I want to thank Ken Quiet Hawk for the intro. Please check out Ken on the on the internet. He can be found as a native storyteller or Ken Quiet Hawk. He and his wife have preserved history in a more verbal way, and actually a more enjoyable way with their native storytelling. And uh, perhaps they. They are one of the kind of historical references that we should become more and more aware of because, frankly, history of writing is is really rather new in comparison to the time we have been on this planet. The show today is, is very special to me because it's about a topic that I am fascinated with. So let me give you a little bit of background before I bring on my amazing guest. Nearly 13,000 years ago, millions of people and animals were wiped out and the world plunged abruptly into a new ice age. It was more than a 1,000 years before the climate and mankind recovered. The people of Gobekli Tepe in present-day southern Turkey, whose ancestors witnessed this catastrophe, built a megalithic monument formed of many hammer-shaped pillars decorated with symbols as a memorial to this terrible event. Before long, they also invented agriculture and their new farming culture spread rapidly across the continent, signaling the arrival of civilization. Before abandoning Gobekli Tepe thousands of years later, they covered it completely with rubble to preserve the greatest and most important story ever told, for future generations. Archaeological excavations began at the site in 1994 and we're now able to read their story. More amazing than any Hollywood plot, again for the first time in over 10,000 years. It's a story of survival and resurgence that allows one of the world's greatest scientific scientific puzzles, the meaning of ancient artworks from the 40,000-year-old lion man figure in a cave in Germany to the Great Sphinx of Giza to be solved. We now know what happened to these people. It probably had happened many times before and since, and it could happen again to us. The conventional view of prehistory is a sham. We've been duped by centuries of misguided scholarship. The world is actually a much more dangerous place than we have been led to believe The old myths and legends of cataclysm and conflagration are surprisingly accurate. We know this because at last we can read an extremely ancient code assumed by scholars to be nothing more than the depictions of wild animals, a code hiding in plain sight that reveals we have hardly changed in 40,000 years, a code that changes everything. And that code was broken by my guest, Dr. Martin Swetman, He's a reader in chemical engineering in the School of Engineering at Edinburgh, 
and for his and for his day job he studies the statistics of the motion of atoms and molecules statistical mechanics using theory and molecular simulation which is has application in many areas including chemical engineering um not only do I stumble over it, I don't understand most of it, but welcome to the show, Martin. <laughs> Hello, Barbara. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Holy mackerel. Couldn't you just be a plain old scientist? Um, <laughs> you, you, well, you I do have try. Studied? I try to do that. Yeah, well. well, no. Oh, you do an amazing job. And, and you know, I think that the fact that you have uncovered this code is a sign and a symbol to all of humanity that it's time we paid attention to our history and started to take notes and prepare for the future because of it. And and I have had a, a, a fascination with Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe ever since they uncovered it. And, I mean, it's, what, 20, 20 acres large, I think, over 20 acres yeah, it's it's okay. a very um, extensive oh. site. So, you know, they, it, it looks pretty big, what they've uncovered, that you can see above ground. Um, but they know from um, radar scans from below the surface that that's just a small part of, of what's there at Quebec Tepe. So, yeah, it, it covers many, many acres. And, um, yeah, it, 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 there are these sort of um, Stonehenge-like stone circles um, they've uncovered, um, well, four large ones and a couple of smaller ones already. Um, but there are probably maybe around 20 of these stone circles, you know, sort of 20, almost 20 Stonehenge-type monuments, all in this one place at Quebec Tepe, on top of this hill uh, in Turkey. Because it's so big and because they know there are so many more, how much more of a story could it possibly tell? And how do you know... Or, or, I mean, do you have the oldest circle or the youngest circle that's been uncovered? Uh, Well, that that is a good question. We don't actually know. Um, So they've they've currently uncovered four large circular circles or enclosures, they they call them. And, in fact, it's the the largest ones are the oldest ones. So they, they seem to have got smaller um, as time progressed, so the oldest one is is the largest. But if you look at the the radar scan beneath the surface, there are probably some some larger ones still remaining. So uh, yeah, they could. Uh, and and the ones that they have uncovered are kind of on the edge of the whole site. So what looks to be the largest is is more or less in the middle. So we don't know, but you know, it, it, there's certainly the potential for finding even older structures um, than the ones that they've currently uncovered. And, and, and I have to say that the, the date, the sort of the oldest date that they have at the moment is about 9,500 BC. So that's 11 and a half thousand years ago. So this is mm-hmm. way, way older than um, the pyramids or the conventional view of the pyramids, at least. It's way, way older than, than Stonehenge. And it's going back into a time uh, to a, peri- a, a geological period when there was this uh, sort of mini ice age, so temperatures in the northern hemisphere of, of Earth plummeted very suddenly by about 5 to 10 degrees, depending on where you were. Uh, and then about a 1,000 years later, they rose very quickly again. So there's this sort of very abrupt dip in temperature or climate in the northern hemisphere that's known as the Younger Dryas period, uh, which covers about um, roughly... 11,000 to, uh, to, to about 9,500 BC. And, and Gebeki Tepe appears in that period. Or, well, the radiocarbon date, the oldest one we have, appears towards the end of that period. So it's a very uh-huh. ancient site. I mean, the, the more I read in your book and the more that I, you know, what research I do is comes from a different sort of direction, all, all I can... I'm more metaphysically, spiritually oriented. I'm not scientifically oriented at all, um, although it comes in handy when I want to prove a point. Um, just wondering, with that many acres and the largest ones still in the center, what more could it tell us? 
And yeah, well, we don't know. That. We have, I we know. have to do the digging to to find out. Uh, and and they are they are the archaeologists are still working at the site. They are um, sort of working away patiently, uncovering um, um, new parts of the site. Um, but you know the, the sort of the largest, what may be the oldest part, um, that is still buried, and, and they don't seem to be looking at that. Unfortunately, not yet, anyway. Wow, I just uh, because what the edges have revealed, I, I can't imagine what what as you get more and more to the center. And my my curiosity is in that I understand, and I yeah, I could be wrong, but but that in what has been already uncovered, the most intricate patterns in that are there are in the oldest um, structures and and the more or less newer structures aren't as complex as the older ones are. Is that appropriate? Yeah, that, that seems to be the way of it. So, I mean, the way that um, I would interpret that is that the older structures were closer to this, uh, this event known as the Younger Dryas um, mm-hmm. impact, which is what I think Gebekli Tepe is telling us all about. So the older structures are closer to that in terms of time. And so that is when um, the people at that time were sort of more interested, more concerned, because it was closer to, their, to them in their history. And as time went by, perhaps things, perhaps uh, the memory kind of faded, because it's, you know, we're talking about thousands of years. Uh, and, you know, they, yeah. So, you know, things change, things change with time. And I think probably the importance of that sort of history gradually dwindled. And I think that's probably why um, the structures became, um, you know, they, they, they invested less effort, let's say, in, in the, the, the newer structures. They became slightly smaller. Perhaps there were fewer people there. We, we don't really know. But perhaps as time went by, you know, um, the number of people that were there interested in, in developing the site gradually dwindled. That's just a, a, a speculation. But it's an idea that well, might work. I think that, that, that what, what you've got here is, is fascinating because I've often, you know, it, it always has fascinated me with the fact that, that we have actually been on this planet for a lot longer than written records suggest. So what came before the written word? You know, how, how were messages given? How, how was information shared? How, how did a generation preserve for the next generation important facts, important things? And, you know, you certainly have come up with, with an extraordinary Actually, I think this is more complex than the written word, to be honest with you. But but it does share uh, a calendar, and it shares events, and it does it it is what precedes the written word as far as the the depictions that are on these pillars. And if if people should go and and Google go Beckley Tepe and take a look at these structures because the carvings are just phenomenal and they're precise and they're not crude they're 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 definitely sophisticated and and you do yes. begin to wonder yeah so go ahead. you're right so i mean you know writing we think began as far as we know around 3000 BC maybe a bit before uh, uh-huh. proper writing uh, and then there was kind of proto writing that we know about which goes back a few thousand years before that um, but that's still about we're still about four thousand years short three or four thousand years short of um, Gebekli Tepe Gebekli Tepe is, is you know three or four thousand years before even that so um, yeah and and if you look at if you look at you know, the symbols at Gebekli Tepe and some of the, the symbols that were this part of this sort of proto-writing system that developed later, they're kind of similar. So you can see that there is a, a development, perhaps, you know, Gebekli Tepe is telling us a little bit about the origin of writing as well, as well as other things. <laughs> it's, it's the origin of lots oh, of things, absolutely. and writing yeah. is, is, is on that path, I think, through Gebekli Tepe. Well, absolutely, and I think what is so phenomenal is that they figured out that You know, even if they had paper or papyrus or whatever, it wasn't going to stand the test of time, but stone does. Um, Actually, our culture, our generation here on the planet in the 21st century, 
um, the only thing in 10,000 years that will be re- that will remain of of us, if we're lucky, is Mount Rushmore. Unless, of course, it takes a direct hit and then all bets are off. But but can you imagine 10,000 years from now, people looking at what remains of Mount Rushmore and and what kind of mythology they are going to um, put to these four faces that are in stone and staring out at nothingness. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. They, that's, what will they make of that? I mean, the ancient Egyptians seemed to, you know, had it right. They they covered many of their monuments with their hieroglyphics, and uh, actually, the you can see there is a kind of relationship between Gebekli Tepe, which is another seven thousand years before ancient Egypt. Uh-huh. You can see that. It's almost like a hieroglyphic kind of writing. Um, and and, and the, the symbols that they were using, these animal symbols, as well as uh, a few other sort of more abstract symbols, um, mm-hmm. the animal symbols, uh, this is part of our decoding now, we, we think the animal symbols represent constellations. And in fact, probably the same constellations, or at least very similar constellations to the ones that we actually still use today. And there's another remarkable correspondence as well. But it, it, it appears that many of the animal symbols at, we, that we find or we see at Quebec um, it's there's quite a strong correspondence between those animal symbols at Quebec Tepe and some of the most ancient, um, some of the earliest ancient Egyptian gods or deities. They have this, the same kind of animal um, sort of relationship. So... Yeah, it's, it's, I think there are lots of interesting links between Gebekli Tepe and the later cultures in the region, and, and not least ancient Egypt. I, th- I think the thing that, that, that boggles my mind, I mean, when you look at the stars, and, and there are constellations out there, absolutely, but how, you know, I, I've, I've looked at, the pictures, you know, that the, they, they, they draw the picture around the stars, and I can, you know, yeah, yeah, I can understand how that could be there, but where did that come from? Because these stick figures and these, these stars that, you know, you can draw lines around, they don't look anything like the animals. So how did, I mean, I, I, I know you don't have an absolute answer, but do you have a, a theory as to how did, how did they get, you know, the bull, and how did they get... Uh, Capricorn, and how did they get the the constellations? Where where do they come from? B- because they're I mean, there. You're quite right. Yeah. I mean, if you if you have Go like ahead. a group of stars, you could make almost anything out of that. Um, so, yeah. but I guess there are certain features of the, certain patterns in the stars that are somewhat reminiscent, perhaps, of the outline of a of an animal shape. But I, I think you know all it takes, I think, is for someone to be to begin that process of saying, right, this group of stars is this animal or it can be represented by this animal symbol. And uh-huh. then you have, I think, you have a very powerful meme. Um, you have a sort of very powerful idea because you know, the stars are fixed. You know, apart from the, the tiny amount of sort of what we call proper motion, the stars are fixed in place. I mean, they, they rotate around the sky, of course, but taking yeah. that into account, the, 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 the individual patterns are, are fixed. And then when you associate uh, an animal symbol, it, it, it perhaps provides a very, um, that's basically telling you how to link the stars together to create a constellation. And I think that combination of the, the, the fixed sort of permanent groups of stars together with a very easily visualized representation in terms of an animal symbol, I think that goes together, potentially that goes together very powerfully to create a very sort of long lasting and durable meme or idea. Uh-huh. So that's a partial explanation, perhaps, as to how this has um, remained relatively constant, uh, you know, passed down yeah, the generations. I, I mean, you've you've definitely come across obviously a system that is clearly there, and and then of course you know you get greedy and you want to know well where did that come from? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, well, so in fact, I mean, uh, that, that's exactly what we did. So. Like you know, when we studied Gebekli Tepe and we came up with this idea of the animals being representing constellations, I mean, we kind of realised immediately that well, this isn't where this system started. Gebekli Tepe is too sort of profound, too uh, you know, there's there's a great deal of 
work and effort gone into its construction. So it's unlikely that this system, this symbolic system was invented at the same time. Probably it began much earlier. And so we then went to look at the cave art that you see in, in, in Europe. And I mean, it goes beyond Europe too, but we looked at the, the cave art in Europe and we found pretty much the same or very similar animal symbols. And we analyzed those symbols too. And we found that we could explain nearly all of all of it through the same system, the same zodiacal system. So probably what you're looking at at Gebeke Tepe has a history that goes back even you know, way back into prehistory, you know, maybe even 30 or 40,000 years ago. Well, it, it does make sense to me because animals move and the stars move in the sky. And, you know, it, it, they, they weren't saying this is a rock and this rock has moved. They, they gave it the name of something that does move in, in real life. So when did you have the aha moment? Which, which constellation was it that, that, that you, you figured first and then moved on from that to see if the others fit? Well, actually, the, the key was in Graham Hancock's book, Magicians of the Gods. So in there, he suggests that um, on, there's, there's a particular pillar at Gebekli Tepe. So I, I was reading Graham's book because I wanted to know more about um, Gebekli Tepe, and I'd read lots of the um, academic research papers. Um, but anyway, I was reading Graham's book, and in, in his book, he mentions or he, he suggests that there's this particular pillar with a vulture sort of stroke eagle symbol on it. He suggests that that could be Sagittarius because it has a reminiscent shape to our, or similar shape to our constellation that we know, that we know as the sort of the hunter, Sagittarius okay. the hunter. So um, the hunter has a bow, an arrow, <clears throat> and the head and the wings of this eagle on the pillar have you know, more or less the same shape as this bow and arrow sort of asterism or, or a set of stars. So um, that was the key um, Oh, and I should say that also on the same pillar, just beneath there, um, just beneath the eagle vulture, is a scorpion symbol. And again, Scorpius appears in the sky just beneath, just beneath uh, Sagittarius. So in Graham's book, he describes those two animal figures and sets out his idea that these might be constellations. And uh, so that then, I looked at that and thought, well, I mean, it sounds maybe a little bit fantastical, but actually it works. Uh, and let's have a look at that in... In more detail so we, we looked at not just pillar 43 but the other pillars at the site and actually it all fell into place we could then with this simple sort of initial key we could then decode pretty much all of the rest just about the rest of Quebec Tepe and not only that but the story it was telling fitted so well with the science this this younger Dryas impact hypothesis um, that it all made um, you know, it, the whole site could be interpreted in this way. So anyway, uh -huh. to answer your question, initially it was Graham Hancock's book, but we developed um, the, the idea you know, quite a lot beyond that and, and, and developed in our, we published some academic papers that have been peer reviewed and we developed this, this system or this method, this mathematical method of, of analyzing the arrangements of the animals to, to give a, a likelihood of this being correct and we found uh, that very likely provided we've got the, the these associations between the animal symbols and the constellations correct and very likely this um, explanation is, is the correct one well then you did the leap from that the symbols refer to equinoxes how did that happen um, so Again, this idea is mentioned in Graham Hancock's book. So he, he suggests that this particular scene on the front of Pillar 43, he suggests mm -hmm. it's giving a date. Okay, because on this, on this pillar, I should go back a step. On this pillar, there is a circle, which we interpret to be the sun. And it's in a particular position relative to the, to the eagle or vulture, which he, which he recognizes um, Sagittarius. And so there is this, um, we then have to ask, well, when is the sun in that position on the summer, on the on one of the solstices or equinoxes? And 
there are only uh, well there, there's, there are four possible dates depending on whether the sun is representing the summer solstice, the winter solstice, or the spring or autumn equinoxes. Uh, and the reason that works is because of this this uh, um, this phenomenon known as precession of the equinoxes. Okay, so on the summer solstice, um, the position of the sun relative to the constellations changes very slowly over time. So over 26,000 years, the position of the sun goes through an entire cycle of the zodiac. So you can actually write a date using precession of the equinoxes. So what you'd have to do is to write down the constellation that the sun is, is next to you. And you can write a date to within a few hundred years using that method. And that, that's what um, the people at Kepepe Tepe appear to have done. Now, the thing about Graham and Hancock's idea is that he suggested that this was the um, representing the winter solstice, and therefore the date is pretty much today's date, or you know, not exactly today, but a modern date in the 20th century. Uh, but we suggested, no, it, that's very unlikely. Much more likely uh, this date is represented using the summer solstice, and, and we have some other evidence for that too. And in fact, if you make it the summer solstice, then the date becomes the date of this catastrophe, the, the Younger Dryas impact. And that makes much more, or at least it becomes close to that date. Uh, and so that makes a lot more sense to us. Uh, this is actually encoding the date of a catastrophe about a thousand years or so before um, that part of Quebec Tepe was, was constructed. So, so in a way... The, the symbols are, are not only a recording of an event, but a warning, a, a warning that it could come again at when when the um, sky was in the same position type thing. Well, not exactly, because it doesn't. Yes, I mean, I, in the sense that it is warning us, um, it, it's telling us of an event in their time or just before their uh -huh. time. And that is useful because it tells us, uh, in, in order for that to have happened, that it means that very likely there's this uh, this theory known as coherent catastrophism, which was developed by some actually some some astronomers at Edinburgh about 40 years ago. It means that very likely their idea, which is that Earth has been impacted by comet fragments uh, over the last few tens of thousands of years, it, it means that very likely their idea is correct. And so in that sense, it does have importance for us. And that is essentially the reason why I thought it was important to, um, to, you know, to write papers and then to write a book about this issue, because it does have direct relevance to us today. So this, this whole notion of coherent catastrophism is that, um, well, a few tens of thousands of years ago, so maybe 20, 30, maybe 40,000 years ago, a giant comet became trapped in the inner solar system. And since then, it's been decaying slowly, so it's been fragmenting. And occasionally, if we're, if we're on an, an unlucky day, uh, Earth will collide with some of the, the larger fragments from this decaying comet. And, and that scenario is pretty much, the, I would say, the only scenario that makes sense with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis and Gebekli Tepe. Uh, so given that there is this giant comet that has been decaying, well, that has implications for us as well, because the, the, the fragments from this decaying comet are still out there in space. They're still orbiting around. And slowly, over in, a, in a, probably another thousand years or so, we will come back into, uh, or rather their orbit of these, these comet fragments, their orbit will change and will come back to crossing, if you like, the densest part of this what's known as a meteor stream. So a decaying comet creates what we see on Earth as meteor streams. And so there's one particular meteor stream, the torrid meteor stream, that is, that is thought to have been generated by this giant comet. And like I say, in about a thousand years' time, the torrid meteor stream will become more intense. Uh, and that, that could be dangerous for us. And that, it seems that perhaps that's been, that is perhaps what has been happening throughout history or prehistory is that occasionally Earth encounters one of the decay products of this, this giant comet. Well, the, we've thrown around the term Younger Dryas a couple of times here, and um, some of my listeners 
probably more than some, <laughs> um, probably aren't aware of what that is. Do you want to kind of explain what, what the Younger Dryas um, boundaries are and what, what, what it refers to? Yeah, so there's this geological period. Uh, it's, um, it's sort of known as like a mini ice age. And it began around about 10,800, 10,900 BC. And it lasted for about 1,300 years. And during this time, um, the northern hemisphere on Earth was much colder uh, than it is today. In fact, it was kind of um, ice age-like condition. So, so the Earth had been coming out of an ice age, the last ice age. We'd, we'd been coming out of it. And then suddenly there was this period known as the Younger Dryas when ice age conditions resumed for about 1300 years. So that's, the, that's known as the Younger Dryas period. Uh, and, but it's not just associated with a change in climate to, to almost ice, ice age like conditions. At about the same time as that period began, there are known to have been changes in human cultures. So quite famously, um, there's the, the Clovis culture in America. And people have connected the, this change in climate to the end of this, the Clovis culture in America. And also there are other cultures over here in Europe that are, that are thought to have been changed by this, um, this sort of onset of a new ice age, this mini ice age, the Younger Dryas. And as well as that, it, it suggested that uh, there are what are known as megafaunal extinctions that occurred at around about this time as well. So there are these strange things that line up. You've got to change a very sudden change in climate. And I, I should say it's about five to 10 degrees across the Northern Hemisphere, a drop in temperature on average. So you've got a, you've got a change in climate, you've got changes in, in human cultures, and you've got these um, megafaunal extinctions all happening more or less at about the same time. So people have put this together, and there's a group of scientists uh, known as the Comet Research Group who have suggested that all of this can be explained by this, or by a comet impact. And this impact is known as the Younger Dryas impact. It's thought to have triggered all of these things. That's the suggestion anyway. Um, and now um, there is, it's not just like a wild speculative idea. It's a very extremely well supported theory. Um, the, the evidence that they found for this impact now got to a level where I would say that probably it's essentially proven. You know, we more or less now know that this giant comet impact happened about 10,800 to 10,900 BC. What we don't quite yet know is whether this impact caused the megafaunal extinctions and the changes in human cultures and the climate change. Probably it did. Almost certainly I would say it caused this, it triggered the younger Dryas um, changing climate, to, you know, this mini ice age. But I, I'm less certain about whether it caused the um, essentially the end of Clovis, as it's known, and the megafaunal and extinctions. I think that's a more open question. But certainly, I think it's more or less proven that the impact actually happened, and it was and it was massive. Well, we, humanity has gone through, I believe, five, what they call them mass extinctions. And from, from what I've read, it, it, it almost feels as though all of them have been caused just about by something that came from the sky, that, that it was, you know, a comet strike, a comet, ex, comet explosion. Um, if, if it was massive enough, it, it would cause um, thousands of years of thousands, hundreds, I don't know, of, of no sun. So that would sho shove the whole planet into a deep freeze. And then whoever survived had to start from scratch again. And, and it does feel as though humanity has been put through this a number of times. And, and, and there aren't any really real records that say, hey, look, this is what happened. Um, you know, maybe you should, you know, have an ark or records hidden someplace or whatever, be, just so that the next time it happens, they don't have to go back to the Stone Age. And... Maybe Gobekli well, Tepe, you know, was one of those. Right, yeah. So if you go back, 
millions of years, then yes, there are these um, great extinction events. And at least one of them, this is, you know, the, the, the well-known one, the, the dinosaur ending one about 66 million years ago, that's thought to have been caused by an asteroid, a large asteroid. The other, the three or four other, well, the four other great extinction events, um, I don't think we actually know yet particularly what caused them. That's a, that's a matter of debate. At least that, that's what I, I think is the case. Yes, I think it's suggested for some of them that they might also have been triggered by uh, asteroid or comet impacts. So, yes, I, certainly asteroid or comet impacts have the potential for great extinctions. Now, the, the younger Dryas event, this impact event that we're talking about, is much more recent, completely different sort of time scale. We're now talking uh, you know, of the order of 10,000 years, whereas before the dinosaurs and so on, the great extinctions, we're talking tens of millions of Wait. years or hundreds of millions of years. Yeah, so a completely different time scale. However, uh, and also the Younger Dryas impact is, is not really on the same scale. So we're not talking about a great extinction event. It's it's um, It's probably an extinction event but it, I wouldn't it's not described as a great extinction it's uh, it's relatively minor in that sense even though it did cause a lot of uh, you know the they called them megafauna so these are the large animals like um, uh, yeah some of the uh, mammoths and um, the large sort of elks and so on uh, and saber-toothed tigers and, and quite a few other species as well um, but it's not on the same scale as these very, very old, sort of millions of years old uh, events. But I mean, what it does say, I think, is that there is this whole spectrum of events. Um, so we know about the, we know only really about the biggest ones that cause great extinctions. And, and the Younger Dryas event is probably an example of, of a smaller event, which is still very destructive. And, and probably there have been lots of these throughout history um, that we simply don't know about because, well, the evidence is, is quite hard to find if you go back millions of years. Yeah, but you were able to. Um, and I think that's one of the fascinating, fascinating things about your work. I mean, um, yeah, there, there's no written records and there certainly is no Google or, or um, you know, saving information in the cloud. However, the planet itself becomes the repository of the history if you know how to read it through through ice samples and things like that so that so that you were able to validate some of this through core samples taken um, in different places well that's that's the work of um, lots of scientists um, uh, and sort of together they're known as the comet research group so there's a bunch of uh, scientists, maybe sort of 60 or so, plus lots of other people on, around the, uh, you know, involved in it as well. Um, so yeah, these scientists have found the evidence, what, what's called the geochemical evidence for this impact event, uh, and they find the evidence in in the in the soil in the sediment across America and uh, and even into Europe uh-huh. and South America and. Potentially, there is, you know, some of the evidence might even be global. So they found the evidence in the sediment. They've looked in ice cores, as you say. Uh, and again, they find uh, this geochemical evidence. And we can make, maybe go into a bit more detail about that, what that evidence is. So they find the geochemical yeah, evidence in yeah. ice cores in, in Greenland. Uh, but I don't think anyone was quite expecting to see the event sort of witnessed almost or recorded and witnessed in stone in this in the world's first temple or it's called the world's first temple anyway whether that's that's entirely accurate but Gebekli Tepe so that was kind of a, a big surprise but yeah so you know the evidence that they have is really extensive and, and completely um, uh, you know I'll say um, overwhelmingly convincing uh, or at least it is to me so they found um, signatures of an impact event um, across on a continental scale, in fact across several continents, as I say, at the Americas and into Europe. So these are things like nano diamonds. So these are tiny 
microscopic, well, even smaller than microscopic, you, you know, no hope of seeing them, even with an optical microscope, you can't see these things. These are nano diamonds. Um, they found what are known as impact spherules. Again, these are sort of microscopic spherules, spherical-like particles made of, um, well, silica, in other words, rock, and um, iron. So sort of metallic and rock-like microparticles. Uh, and they, these are all in the same level, the same layer in the sediment, at what is known at the bottom of what is known as the Younger Dryas black mat. And also, there's another signature as well, which is platinum. So we know one of the, one of the the key things about the dinosaur in ending impact 66 million years ago. One of the sort of convincing signals there was a was a, a layer of iridium. Around the whole globe, uh, around the whole world, at a level in the sediment corresponding to this time frame. Well, now for the Younger Dryas impact, they found a layer of platinum. And again, the only way that you can really explain the platinum, the nano diamonds, and the microspherals, and, and these are all confirmed by you know several independent research groups. So it's been confirmed that these signals exist widely across multiple continents and all within a time frame consistent with uh, a single impact event. So it pretty much confirms that the, the impact happened. And then if you look in Greenland, now the Greenland ice is, is a really excellent sort of store of geochemical information because um, you know, when, when you know, the, the event happens or something happens and you have all these chemicals that get... Um, that get absorbed into the, the sort of surface ice layer. And then you have new snow that comes along each year and you get layers and layers and layers of ice building up with the chemical signatures are trapped in those layers and preserved essentially, well, for until the ice melts, which in other words, they're preserved for up to, well, potentially millions of years, depending on how, how long the, the ice lasts there for, the ice sheet lasts. So anyway, there are these signals trapped in the Greenland ice too. And the, you know, the most convincing evidence that I've seen is that there is a platinum, there's a spike in platinum in one of these layers. And they and we can see that at a you know within the time scale of just a few years, we can see this spike in platinum and it occurs at the within a few years at the same time as this rapid drop in climate. In fact we can't tell them apart at the moment. We we, we can't see there is any gap between this platinum signal and the change in climate at the at the start of the younger dryer so it really does look it's really convincing evidence that it was this impact event which generated the platinum that caused or triggered this um the younger dryas geological um sort of ice age wow so <laughs> so we have yeah. so, we, so we have the evidence of it and I, I think what what is so fascinating is that a lot of these events, a lot of these circumstances um come to us not not through writing because of course, you know, if you go back further in time there's no writing and there's no pictographs and there's no nothing. But but you have these legends and when when you talk of you know there are there are legends of fire in the sky and there there and and when you go back and you look at a lot of the um stories even from the bible it it, it all seems to fit in very nicely into what what a a comet strike or or something like that would would look like or seem like to the people so that so that these situations have have been the seed for a lot of the um, myths that that have come through through generations and and centuries and and thousands of years that um, that we've been I think, I you know, that's passing. Exactly right. <clears throat> I think that's exactly right. So yeah, we, there are all these myths, and they are so common. I mean, I mean common. I mean similar. Um, yeah. across, you know, in different parts of the world, stories, um, like you say, of, <clears throat> excuse me, of a great flood, perhaps, or stories of great conflagration from the sky. So in other words, fire from the sky. 
stories of uh, a cosmic serpent. So a snake or a serpent in the sky that falls to earth, perhaps a flaming snake or perhaps there's some other kind of uh, you know, firebolt or something that strikes the earth. It's so common. It's so um, common is not the right word. It's so pervasive across across the world, uh, and it seems to form. You know, it's it's the heart of many of our most well known religions. Mm-hmm. Now I've seen. And the way um, of explaining. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I suspect that you know at least within, within our part of the world that Gebekli Tepe has something to do with that, you know. So Gebekli Tepe is called the world's first temple. We don't know that it's a temple, but it kind of makes a lot of sense that it represents the change in belief, at least, uh, probably a new religion. Uh, and probably that religion was motivated, I suggest, by this younger Dryas impact event. And then it, the thing about Gebekli Tepe is it also... It's there, at the, it's there at the origin of civilization. So at a time that's even before agriculture, a few thousand years before the development of agriculture. <clears throat> and so I suggest that probably what happened was that there was this impact event. It generated this new religion, which we can see operating at Quebec and Tepe. And, and that then essentially sparked civilization. And you have this religion and agriculture, which developed later, then sort of diffusing outwards from this this region of the world known as the Fertile Crescent into parts of Asia, into Europe and south, uh, in, and into sort of parts of North Africa. And so that's probably why you have a lot of similarities in these myths uh, and religions in this part of the world. Now, I think the strange okay. thing is you also find the same myths, or at least very similar myths, uh, in the New World, what we call the New World, the Americas, so North America, South America, Central America, we see very similar myths again. So, you know, it seems to have been a worldwide um, sort of phenomenon. Well, yeah, and, and people, you know, will explain or describe from their own frame of reference. Um, I can remember seeing a, it was a fireball. It probably was um, some satellite coming to Earth and through the atmosphere, but you could it it, it looked it looked like a a circular um, globe of fire. It was orange and it 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 fell to Earth. And all I could think of was, well, you know, it's a satellite or something burning off in the atmosphere. But but that's because I know that those things are out there. But if if a, if there was a comet strike, there had to have necessarily theoretically. There had to be um, something that preceded it, which easily could be, you know, the cosmic dust or whatever flaming off in the atmosphere, which would terrify people, and then a, a whammy of, of a strike of some sort. So that, so that it, it yeah, I, I can see how easily that would that would create religions in a heartbeat. You know, um, somebody's angry at me, and I better appease them, and I don't know what I need to do, type stuff. So. Um, on um, some of the uh, some of the pillars at Gobekli Tepe um, represented, you suggested sky gods of some sort. I, I was <laughs> I was explaining how I saw this fireball fall to Earth, and because I understood that there were things out there that would fall to Earth, it didn't upset me. But you know, in in a more primitive culture, I would have questioned, you know, what have I done? What's wrong? And, and I, I think I asked, I did, I asked you, um, you weren't there, but I asked you, um, don't some of the pillars in Gobekli Tepe represent um, uh, gods of some sort, um, you know, whether it is zodiac gods or sky gods of some sort? Well, possibly, yes. Yeah. So there are, at the center of the enclosures that have been uncovered, normally there is a pair, a large pair of pillars. Uh, and these, this pair of pillars have a kind of anthropomorphic or almost human-like form. Well, they have some human-like features anyway. So these pillars have arms and hands that are clasped in front of their bellies and, and they're wearing loincloths and belts and brooches around their, well, what 
perhaps would be their necks. So you know, they have sort of human-like features. So you can think of them perhaps as gods or, you know, for them. And yeah, and so you know, somehow I guess they were they were interpreting this event along with some kind of mythology or religion involving probably some kind of sky being or sky god. That's um, That would make a lot of sense for what we know about um, the myths and religions going back into history and prehistory. So, yeah, probably, you know, they, they would have, yeah. I know the Moray described the Milky Way as a pathway of souls, and they didn't really have a religion as much as a spiritual understanding of this is where the spirit goes when it leaves the body type stuff. Um, I think the element of religion um, is reasonably new. Um, you know, uh, yeah, Greek, Greeks and Roman and Norse, they all had gods. But if you go back to even more primitive times, I, I don't. From what I understand, and I could be I could be wrong, but from what I've read, there was no really religion as much as there was a spiritual understanding that there was more out there than than just us here. So. Yeah, I mean, it depends how you define <laughs> your religion, I suppose. But yeah, we don't really know. Of course, we don't really know how the dealt with this or viewed this or sort of communicated this to each other so what form their religion took um but yeah like you say there are these these central pillars in each in each enclosure that have some kind of godlike sort of symbolism or you know, it could be interpreted that way anyway uh, and that fits with what we know about later cultures having this this there's a very um widespread sky brother myth so in, in lots of cultures you can see that there are these brothers uh and they're viewed as sort of deities uh, and uh, and quite often one of them dies or is killed or is sacrificed whilst the other lives and then civilization restarts so that's quite a common theme in many myths or religions and so you could perhaps link these these twin pillars at Gebekli Tepe with that myth. It may it might not be the origin of that myth, but it seems to be a particular instance of this sort of sky brother myth. Well, they um, at least from what I understand, that they haven't actually even found a town or or anything that looks like a town anywhere near Gobekli Tepe. So why why can you guess why that particular site was chosen since it's not a place where there was a community of any sort there there doesn't seem to be a town to support a, you know a, a structures this large and this large a structural um community it's not it's not a place where people lived so yeah i mean that's one of that's one of the um things about the sort of the conventional ideas expressed by the site's archaeologists i say conventional these are, these are their opinions essentially of the site's archaeologists are that um it's you back at tepe it was just a meeting place you know what was its function well probably people just met there why? Well, they don't, they don't really know, but maybe to have feasts. But like you say, why would they do that on top of a hill <laughs> far from, you know, it's not a convenient place to meet and feast. You, at, or, and, and it's not a convenient place particularly to build um, a megalithic, well, let's call it a temple. So why particularly were they building this place on top of a hill in such an inconvenient place? Well, again, this is a we have an explanation for that in, in our, we can explain that through our astronomical interpretation. And, and that's because uh, they were very interested in keeping an eye on the stars. And, you know, maybe if their gods were related to the stars and the constellations in some way, then they would need to have a good view of the stars and, and what better way to do that than on, on top of a hill. So I think you know, the fact that it's on top of a hill really helps to support this idea that 
they were observing the stars, and that's all well, connected the thing, with their beliefs. <laughs> has there ever been, and, and you, you probably, I mean, there's not now, but has there ever been, or is there, are there signs that there was ever water nearby? To my because knowledge, to my knowledge, um, there isn't uh, a, a convenient source of water, no, to my knowledge. Um, so, you know, that it's not the most convenient place for meeting and feasting. They, if they were going to do that, then they would just do it down in the valley near one of their, um, you know, perhaps near a, a nice watering hole or something or next to a river. Uh-huh. But um, they didn't. So it was, it was on top of a hill, miles from, as far as I can tell, miles from any convenient source of water. So why would they do that? And where is the closest archaeological site to Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, so I mean, if you in the region around Gobekli Tepe, you know, within about sort of 10, 20, well, 20 kilometers or so, there are some archaeological sites. Um, she, the nearest city is Shanliurfa, uh, I think it's about 10, 10 kilometers away. So that's now a very big city, but it might, might have had a very ancient origin. Uh, in, in history or prehistory, it was known as Urfa. It's recently become known as Shanliurfa. Yeah, so Urfa or, you know, it, it's, um, has sort of biblical... Um, I think it's mentioned uh, in, the, in the Bible, I think, perhaps, connected with Abraham... So anyway, yes, there are well, there are some historical settlements, but um, there's nothing that we know of that's very close to Gabaki Tepe itself. So it is a bit of a mystery as to where all the people were. And that makes me think again that you know, perhaps this is a specialized group of people, that this wasn't just a, a normal community that was sort of living there, that probably these were some kind of priests, maybe astronomer priests, and they had like a special duty... Um, to, you know, to, to maintain their temple or sanctuary, whatever you call it, and to observe the stars and to, and to, and to write down what had happened. So probably this was a special group of people. That, that's the way I would see it. Well, I would have to agree with you on that one. But now, how old is Jericho? Jericho is the oldest in the Bible, I think, and that, that doesn't even come close to this. 3,000, 4,000 well, years? Well, yeah, so, so, the origins of Jericho are actually, they actually do go a long way back into prehistory. The origins of, origins of Jericho, I think, go back to before 8000 BC. In fact, I think, I'm not entirely sure, I think that there are archaeological excavations that show that there was um, a city wall and um, like a, a, a tower, a stone tower was built in Jericho and I'm not sure of the date, but it might have been as early as 8,000 BC. So Jericho is really ancient. In fact, Jericho is, is one of those settlements that is almost contemporaneous with the end of Gebekli Tepe. So, in fact, so Jericho could have been one of those places that, that people moved to you know, after after the, sort of the age of Gebekli Tepe, when you know, the things started to dwindle and people lost interest in it a bit. Maybe Jericho is one of those communities that people went to as, as offering a bit more bit more for them yeah it's a long commute for sure um <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i just knowing it's how 200 miles yeah i but knowing how how labor intensive all of this work is and and the same thing you know um confuses me about um even hieroglyphs on on the um uh, in egypt that They are so precise, they are so detailed, they are so intricate that, that, you know, this many thousands of years even before that, you get the same thing at Gobekli Tepe. I mean, those, the engravings on on the the first, the the pillar you talked about, um, 43 was it? Uh, they're, They're pristine. They... Have you you you've been there, right? You've seen them. Yeah, I went. I was there just recently. I was there just recently. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, my first time to have a look. So, 
do you see chisel marks? Do you see any kind of marks that could have created them? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get that. <laughs> we weren't allowed to get that close. But uh, I mean, ah. you're right. The the engravings on the pillars are are very well preserved because they've been buried. You know, because they were buried when uh, at the end of Gebekli Tepe's life, which is roughly mm-hmm. about 8,000 BC, perhaps a little later. Uh, it seems that the site was buried, probably deliberately, although we can't say for sure. And it seems to preserve the stonework really well. That might have been why it was buried to, to do that. Uh, so you know, the, the, and the quali- as you say, the quality of the carvings is uh, is surprising. This is one of the things that surprised archaeologists when it was uncovered was just how good um, and just how sophisticated these these carvings were. You know, the stonework is is excellent. Well, and and the fact that you know how they are arranged gives you a date and tells you you know basically what was going on there because there are a couple of places where um you know y- you can tell that that the, the engravings are depicting a catastrophic destruction or death and it gives you the date of it so uh, i forget well, what that, that's, that's pillar 43 well known as commonly known as the or popularly known as the vulture stone um yes. so yeah that's the one that has the date that we it's kind of decoded using some kind of statistical analysis so we're fairly sure that that is encoding the date uh, and the date corresponds really closely to the younger dryas impact event um and then if you look at some of the other pillars they you know using the same kind of way of interpreting them they all pretty much all support this view that you know we're, we're talking about some kind of dramatic cosmic event so there's another pillar pillar 33 actually if your if your if your listeners are interested, I have a blog where I go through every single pillar that we currently know about and, and say uh, and, and, and um, sort of interpret the the carvings on its surface. So uh, my blog is martinsweatman.blogspot.com. I've got a bunch of articles there, but one of the most recent ones is a complete sort of interpretation of Gebekli um, Tepe's pillars. Anyway, there's okay. another pillar, pillar 33. And on this, it's a very, a very nice pillar. On this pillar, on one side, you have a fox. And on the other side of the pillar, you have a pair of tall birds. Now, we've previously in, decoded the fox to be uh, the constellation Aquarius. And the bird, the bending bird, the tall bending birds, we've interpreted to be Pisces. And the great thing on this pillar is that coming out of these foxes and birds are snakes. All right, so it's they're kind of emanating from the bodies of the foxes and the birds on this pillar. So, you know, and, and that the archaeological, the standard archaeological explanation is that these are just pictures of actual birds and snakes and foxes. But of course, it doesn't make any sense because... In, in, in reality, snakes don't just emerge from the bodies and legs of foxes and birds. It just doesn't happen. But when you view it in our, uh, in terms of our interpretation, where the animals represent constellations, then the snakes that are coming out of them are a very nice picture of a meteor stream. And so that all, again, that all ties in with this view that the people there were observing meteor streams because of the the impact that they'd experienced maybe a thousand years before, which was, and I should say that there is a, you know, uh, meteor streams are just, are, are generated by particles of comet, or comet dust, okay, so that's what a meteor stream is, so um, I remember I, I mentioned that it was the torrid meteor stream that we think is the one that's um, orbiting around in space, uh, that is sort of kind of dangerous for us. So it seems well, anyway that these snakes, we can interpret these snakes as meteor streams, and okay. um, you know again it, that supports this view or our interpretation. So if if there is a, a meteor strike, it isn't just one solid piece, slam bang, thank you, ma'am, and that's it. It's there's usually fragmentation and and a stream of of that either precedes and or comes after so that's that, right that's so a that, very important point actually so yeah so you know this 
probably, you know, th there's this whole theory I mentioned, coherent catastrophism of this giant comet trapped in the inner solar system, decaying over tens of thousands of years. They, the people ar around that time, they would have noticed this, you know, that, that wouldn't have been invisible to them. This giant comet at particular times, not all the time, but at certain times when it came close, it would have been highly visible. Possibly they could have even seen it stretching across the sky, even in, even in daytime. So they would have seen, probably, this giant comet. Uh, certainly they would have seen the, the meteor stream, which, uh, and the intensity of the stream would have varied over thousands of years, um, as it continues to do. So they would have seen this. They might even have, have had some warning that... Um, you know, the event was was imminent. They <clears throat> they might have seen this sort of, uh, comet fragment perhaps getting closer and closer to them over a few tens of years as as it was orbiting around. They might have seen it, its passage to Earth getting closer and closer. And so, you know, they they would have probably been watching this and observing, and uh, probably been quite frightened. Now, if a meteor a meteor shoots off comets, and the comet is what hits the Earth, right? Sorry, I missed that, Barbara. Can you say that again? So, so a meteor fragments and sends, and and what it fragments become comets. Is that how it goes, or is there a difference between a meteor and a comet? It's the other way around. So, the, the comet is orbiting around and and decaying, and it's it's the decay of the comet, the, the particles that have decayed off the comet that we see as the meteor stream, and and some of those particles are, can be larger, much larger than the others. In fact, some of them can be huge fragments. And it's those huge fragments that are much, you know, they're much rarer, but it's the occasional huge fragment that can then um, impact the Earth. Uh, and, and, pr and what tends to happen, at least this is the, the theory, you have a, the, the sort of, the theory of coherent catastrophism. What it suggests is that you have some kind of decay event, so the comet releases another large fragment, but it's not just one large fragment. You have a whole host of you have a swarm essentially a swarm of, of comet particles that are released during this fragmentation event and so probably you, you get a whole bunch a whole swarm of particles of varying sizes all impacting earth on the same day probably there would have been some massive impact event somewhere maybe a couple of them and then there would have been a widely distributed number of other smaller local uh, impact events and, and and not all of these uh, impacts would have reached the ground so probably there would have been relatively few where well, relatively few fragments comet fragments that were large enough to impact the ground probably most of them uh, were too small and would have exploded in the atmosphere as what we know as air bursts now these air bursts can still be very damaging on the ground okay they still release a a lot of energy, uh, they create fireballs that are then sort of projected down onto the ground you know, through the momentum of the, the incoming fragments. So you know, it's still a damaging situation. But not all of these is things that, might it, have reached the ground. Is yeah. that what happened in Russia that flattened the forest? That's right. So that's, um, I think what you're referring to there is known as the Tunguska event. So that happened in yes. 1908. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that flattened an area of Siberian forest about twice the size of Greater London. And, and so you, you can see pictures on the internet of this, um, you know, the, the trees are all sort of lying flat on the ground and they're burned and yeah. they're kind of lying in the same direction as well because of the direction of the, uh, the blast wave at that particular point. So when... Yeah. When when <laughs> when it it is orbiting, is it spinning? So if it's spinning, then then there is a a cloud that that surrounds it. It isn't just you know when I think of when 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 they depict it out you know in in movies and stuff like that, it's one solid piece of rock that's just floating through space, hurtling at us. But if there's rotation, then then there are fragments of it that that become a cloud that come before it and a cloud that comes after it. So. In a way, there's there's some sort of warning, and then the explosion, and then there's the the aftermath, so to speak. So it's not just a single event; it's 
it's it's a series of ma- major events. Yeah, so I mean the uh, yeah the, for a long time sort of the typical view of you'd have you'd be thinking in terms of an asteroid impact. Now an asteroid impact is a little different normally because you just have one single body, one single fragment if you like. Mm-hmm. But for comets, they, they fragment into these swarms. And so that's right. So you can get multiple impacts, maybe hundreds or thousands of different impact points on Earth, some large, some small. And um, I'm going to plug, there's a very recent film, actually, I think, which has taken up the idea of like a, an impact swarm called Greenland. Now, I haven't seen it, but um, yeah, it, it kind of, uh, I think it was only released a few weeks ago or months ago. It, I think it describes this this idea of a, a comet swarm impacting Earth. I'll check it out. <laughs> um, yeah, I, <laughs> I haven't I, seen it I, myself I, yet. I'd like. I, I like movies like that. I, I, you know, it's a little sick, but I enjoy watching the world destroyed. You know, so long as it doesn't really get destroyed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a disaster. Uh, the the graphics are often you know quite fascinating. So, so when you when you're looking at this kind of an event in the, in in our history and our knowledge and our recorded history and writing, and anyhow, nothing like this has happened. I, I know it's a big universe out there, but is is there a chance that this will happen again? Uh, there is a chance. Yeah. Um... Not imminent, I have to say. You know, so you, your listeners shouldn't get very worried. Um, there's not an imminent yeah. chance because we 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 can we've seen the the um, you know we can see this, the skies very well. We've had lots of um, space missions and, and and telescopes and and space telescopes that have been observing the near Earth environment. And so we we've got a very a very good catalogue of all the different. Um, objects that are potential threats to Earth. Um, however, as I said, on a time scale of maybe a thousand years, this, um, this this torrid meteor stream is going to its orbit is going to evolve, and we will then encounter a, a, a sort of denser part of the meteor stream. And there are some big objects in there. Um, but there are a lot, probably a lot of smaller objects that we can't see, and we don't know how many of them there are because they're smaller. Um, so there's that possibility that you know, in a thousand years' time, the the risk from uh, one of these comet swarm impacts is is going to be higher than it is today because of the way that the torrid meteor stream evolves. And then there's another possibility, which is that. Now, thousands of years in our future, another one of these giant comets, now, now these giant comets, they come from the outer solar system. And depending on how they orbit, they, it's possible that they can get trapped in the, into the inner solar system. Now, these are rare events. They only happen very infrequently. And I'm talking many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, or even actually hundreds of thousands of years, but it's still possible. <laughs> that a giant comet from the outer solar system can become trapped in the inner solar system where it decays, uh, and it's those decay products that then cause a, a, an increased risk of impact to Earth. So probably we should, be, we should be doing more to find out about this torrid meteor stream, about all the objects that are in it. We have seen the largest objects that are a few kilometers in size or, or a kilometer across, but probably there's a whole bunch of smaller objects of the order of hundreds of meters that we're not yet aware of uh, that may be orbiting within this this meteor stream. And in fact, you know, the, the, the Tunguska explosion 1908 is, is thought to, by many, thought to be one of these uh, sort of smaller fragments. It's thought to have been about 100 meters across, 50 to 100 meters probably, it's thought. Yeah. This this uh, this Tunguska impactor, which flattened an area twice the size of, of London. Okay, now I'm going to get that, a little. Of yeah, I, I I'm going to tread a little off the scientific pathway here. Um, 
mm-hmm. be- because because it it appears that the um, younger Dryas uh, opened humanity up to the beginning of quote unquote civilization and archaeology and also and I, I find it fascinating that that we we weren't farming we were basically hunter gatherers we were um, sort of primitive. And yet, we understood astrology, and that seems very strange. That that you know we weren't able to plant crops and, and domesticate animals, but but we could understand the progression of the equinoxes. The two seem strangely incompatible, and yet that seems to be what happened. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big surprise, I think. Yeah. But then if so, you go back far enough, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, well, if you go, go back. back uh, go back to the earliest, some of the earliest cave paintings, um, some of the earliest cave art. So I mentioned this in my book, um, the, the Lion Man of Holstein Stadel Cave. It's actually uh-huh. a really good carving. Um, I think it's made out of mammoth tusk. It's about oh, a foot it's beautiful. Yeah. Long. And it's a really nice carving. And that's 40,000 years old. Now, in the same caves, very very close system of caves, um, they've also found the fragments of a flute, in fact, probably more than one flute. Uh, and these flutes were made out of, I think it's vulture wing bones. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the people back then you mentioned the word primitive. Well, in a sense, they were primitive, but actually they were pretty sophisticated. Even though they didn't have agriculture, even though they didn't live in cities, they were they were not stupid. They were the same as us intellectually. It's just that their technology was, you know, practically non-existent almost. But they were still able to make musical instruments with, a, with what's known as a pentatonic scale, this 40,000-year-old this flute had a pentatonic uh-huh. scale. So in other words, it had five notes on, a, on an octave. Yeah. Uh, and so you, I, you, know, you could recognize tunes played on this flute. In fact, there's a, there's a very nice YouTube video about that. It might be interesting. Yes, I saw that. He played uh, the Star Spangled Banner on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 there's, there's also the, the sh- which fascinated me, and, and I'm going to put a plug in for a video too, um, in is it France in, in uh, a cave called Chauvie? Um, That's right. It has the most beautiful painting uh, artwork I've ever seen, and and the name of the video is uh, Cave of Dreams, and um, there are two of them out there on YouTube. One's free and one's paid for. Uh, spend your couple bucks and get the paid for one. The the audible is far better, but but the paintings are just um, they would sell currently. They're so beautiful and they have kept the cave pristine so that you know people's breath hasn't brought in bacteria and uh, they are very selective about how many people go in and for how long and they can't get off the treadway and. But the the documentary is is just outstanding, and when you look at this artwork, um, it's not stick figures. These animals are depicted in motion, and they are they they're shading, and you can see musculature, and it's it's uh, you sit there. I know that they they there were. Um, Scrapings from torches that, that they carbon dated back to 28,000 years ago, but they suspect that the drawings are even older than that. So um, that's right. So, yeah. These cave paintings go back probably 35,000 years, something like that. And, then, and then so yeah, the horses. Yeah, the thing is, yeah. Now, now, now yeah. Um, two things that, that I find amazing: um, the horses. Felt that they were domesticated. There's no indication that they were, but it just felt like that there was there were so many of them that that 
they they probably in my mind were domesticated and the only footprints they found in the cave were that of a young boy and a wolf and they appeared to be next to one another which would suggest that the wolf was domesticated um to a degree so it makes you take another look at historically what these people were like um and that this goes back 40,000 years or more and you know yeah. they aren't people walking around with their knuckles dra- you know dragging on the ground they're people with an artistic eye that had that in these caves had no electricity or no light so they had to do whatever they did with um with torches so that so yeah. that they were so in complete that, darkness it's it's a really a really important point, Barbara, is that, yeah, the people back then were just as smart as we are. I mean, they would have had their geniuses uh, as we do today. So they, they, we, we know they were, we can see that they were accomplished artists in the paintings and the, the figurines that they've carved. Um, I think there are, they, they found items of jewelry, essentially bracelets with holes drilled in them uh, in other caves. So you know they they made jewelry they they played musical instruments they did great artworks paintings on the cave walls so why not astronomy you know so you don't need uh, agriculture you don't need a city life in fact you're better off without a city living in a city oh, yeah. if you want to observe the skies you know it's so much clearer and of course astronomy has other uses too so you can use it to track the seasons, that's very important. And as I said, you can use this, this, this phenomenon of precession of the equinoxes to write dates. Now, those dates aren't very accurate, of course. They, you, know, you can write them with a precision of, say, 100 years or so. Um, but, yeah, you, you can write dates. And, of course, astronomy would have been useful as well for, for navigation. You know, you know, you look at the sky at night, you know where you are, roughly. Mm-hmm. You can track your course across the world. So... Um, important if you want to um, sort of travel across the seas or the oceans. So, you know, astronomy would have been really useful to them, I'm sure. And if you think about it, you know, it's nighttime. There's a lot of nighttime when it's dark. The stars are there. Half your time is spent beneath the stars. What are you going to do? You're going to make up stories. You're going you're to look at the patterns. So it's kind of obvious that they were doing astronomy. You don't need well, agriculture. You don't need to sense. live in a city to do it. That, that does that does make sense. And what I find fascinating is that that the depictions on that I saw were basically of animals, and and they even had a way of depicting motion, so that some animals had like um, eight legs, which gave you the idea that they were moving fast and rapidly. So that so that uh, I, it's amazing artwork. Please, you know, everybody after after the show, of course, don't go right now, but mm. um, check out Cave of Dreams. It was amazing. But for the most part, what I have seen um, are animals. Um, there aren't a lot of depictions of other humans, except in, in the show V Cave. There's there's a whole wall covered with somebody's handprint. Somebody got really wild with red red ochre or, or something and there are handprints that there's one wall where there's just massive handprints and, and what was what was fascinating was that he had a deformed little finger so that you could always tell when he did the artwork because if there was a handprint there you knew it was the deformed pinky guy. So um <laughs> but why <laughs> why no people? Why just Anna I mean th- there was a carving that that sort of resembled a female. Um, yeah, but and you're right. There are there are very few carvings of, well, yeah, let's say none, almost. Well, yeah. So there are no yeah. people. But what you do find occasionally are sort of human-like figures that then have like an animal head. So they kind of mix them, and and again, perhaps these were representing some kind of mythical creature perhaps a god of, of some type. But you're right, you, you just don't see 
Well, there, actually, there is there is one cave scene that we know of um, that does have a human figure, but again, it has it either has a bird head or it has a mask, like a like a bird mask. So, and this is the Lasco shaft scene. This is a different cave now. This this cave is was thought to have been occupied around about fifteen thousand BC um, in southern France. And there's this particular in the Lasco shaft scene in that sorry in the Lasco cave system, there is a shaft which goes down um, quite a few feet. I'm not sure exactly how far, maybe sort of twenty feet or something. There's this shaft that goes down. And at the bottom of this shaft is this sort of um, grotto or, or cave. And on the walls is this, this scene known as the Lasco shaft scene. Uh, and that scene has a person uh, in it, like I say, either with like a bird's head or with like a bird mask on them. And, um, and actually, that's a very, another very interesting uh, piece of artwork because in that scene, the person is dying or is, is, is kind of, well, it's falling over. We assume they're kind of uh-huh. dying. And at the same time, next to them, there's this great um, painting of a bull. Uh, and the bull is, seems to be pierced by what looks like a spear or something like a spear, and its entrails are falling out underneath, you know. Um, so again, the, the bull is, uh, looks to be dying, killed by whatever this spear-like thing is. Now, again, we can try to interpret this using our zodiacal system. So in, in that convention, the bull is representing the constellation Capricornus. Uh, not Taurus as it is today. Today we think of the bull as representing Taurus. But in the ancient zodiac uh-huh. that we decoded, which we think appears at Gebekli Tepe and, and appears back in this ancient cave art, the bull represents Capricornus, it seems. And so you they have to ask, well, what is, why would they represent what is probably or can be interpreted as a constellation, particularly Capricornus? Why would that be disemboweled and dying because of some kind of spear-like object? Well, it just so happens that at that time, the torrid meteor stream would have been emanating from the direction of Capricornus. Okay, so the... The torrid meteor stream, its orbit evolves over time, and the point in the sky from which it radiates changes very, very slowly. So back at the time the cave was occupied, 50,000 BC, the torrid meteor stream would have been radiated from the direction of that constellation Capricornus. So we can, can interpret that as another meteor strike, or comet strike, at around about 15,000 BC. And just coincidentally, or maybe it's not coincidence, the archaeological record shows that in, in southern France, at around about 15,000 BC, this period, this cultural period known as the late, um, the late middle Magdalenian period, came to an end. So suddenly, the archaeological record in southern France just kind of stops. There are no more campsites. They don't find, there's like a population collapse in that region, which lasts for... Well, over a thousand years. So one explanation is that this Lasco shaft scene is describing another cosmic impact from the Torrid meteor stream, which we kind of expect anyway. And it caused this population collapse, the end of the late middle Magdalenian period in southern France. Hmm. And and again, they're sent back to um, smaller population and... I guess back yeah, they to start again. gathering. Yeah. So that so that yeah. and frankly, if I was going to record something of huge magnitude, I mean it would have to be huge for me to to want to memorialize it. Um or leave a record as to, you know, where we've gone or there's there's no more here. It, it's kind of like the Roanoke mystery, you know, there were a couple of stones that were left behind, but then the rest of them were frauds. But it was kind of like carving in stones something to remind you of an event that happened. Yeah, so, so and, you go back to this Lasco shaft scene, you've got this, this person dying. Now, you know, the sort of standard view of that is that, well, that's 
describing an individual person dying. But if that was the case, you know, if people at that time wanted to record individuals dying, then there'd be thousands of these paintings of people uh-huh. dying. But we don't see that. We just see one painting. And we can interpret from that a date which corresponds very closely with the end of this um, particular cultural period in southern France. So it doesn't really make sense to say that this scene is recording a single death. Probably it's a much more important event like than that, which also explains why they crawled down this difficult passageway down into this deep shaft to record this event, you know, because it was a very, very difficult place to get to and, and to do this painting. So, so it was not a man, but it was men dying or manhood well, dying. Well, people, and, yeah. yeah, that's the, that's the I, that we have. I think that that what 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 makes me wonder is, you know, the, situations like this have happened before, so you kind of become curious then as to. You know, we go we go before the last ice age, you know, and go back forty, eighty thousand years. It, it I know that humans, human erectus, they they say, has been on the planet for one hundred and thirty thousand years. So, what happened before? Where are the records of that? I mean, you know, the cave art that goes way back that far is. A little more primitive than than what we're talking about right now, which is only about forty or so thousand years, give or take. So, where is the shift in in civilization, in in gathering together in groups and having um, farming and stuff? Because clearly, it had to have been there before, and yet there's no record of it. Yeah. No, that's it. So, as far as we can tell, as far as we can tell, civilization began. If you can call it civilization, um, at around about the time of Gebekli Tepe, about Mm -hmm. say twelve thousand years ago, or so. And before that, yeah, as far as we can tell, people were hunter gatherers. Uh, and we wouldn't call that, I don't think we would call that civilization, although the people might have been quite sophisticated with musical instruments and uh, and their sort of naked eye astronomy and, and artwork, we wouldn't call that civilization. I think I think you have to think about people living in cities or at least large communities, that's, that's civilization. So, yeah, what were they doing all this time before? Well, and, well and I mean, if you go... If you look at the size of their heads, you know what 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 skeletal remains we have. Their heads were bigger, so there was. I don't think there was an empty space in there. They had a brain, so that <laughs> and and, no. and they 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 developed weapons. They developed jewelry. They developed a lot of things, sewing and and stuff like that. So, um, that's right. So, it just you know, it, Homo it, sapiens. Yeah, Homo sapiens yeah, have been I, around, we think, for maybe 200,000 years, maybe more. Yeah. But it does take time for, you know, it does take a lot of time for new inventions, discoveries t- to be made and to become sort of widespread in use. So, you know, y- you have this view that the advancement of technology, if you like, or, or human advancement, it, it's exponential. In other words, it, it increases ever more rapidly as time progresses. So you wouldn't expect maybe 200,000 years ago suddenly for this great city to pop up out of nowhere because you know the, it, these things take time. And, and maybe they take 100,000 or even 200,000 years to get to the point where you could start living in a city. So... Or, or yeah. is it maybe even a case of if you get knocked back six paces, then you come forward eight, and then you get yeah. knocked back. So every yeah. time you have to come back, you come back faster and better. Could it possibly be that? Yeah, yeah so we, we have to now, I think, you know, 
with this latest evidence with, with Quebec Tepe and the, the Younger Dryas impact event and coherent catastrophism, I think we have to take into account that view as well, that maybe there were all these other impacts, probably none as large as the Younger Dryas event, that seems to have been a particularly bad one, but perhaps there were these other impacts that were holding humanity back, at least maybe over the last 20, 30,000 years, maybe a bit longer. Maybe they were preventing us reaching our, or developing so quickly, you know, knocking us back into more primitive ways for a while, and then we had to recover and, and um Well, you look, at, you, look at so, the, yeah. you look at the Bosnian pyramids, though, and, and some of the glyphs that they have found on the rocks inside the tunnels by the Bosnian pyramid do suggest that there was some sort of written record of some sort that was, that was you know, being, tra- being left there for others to find at some point in time. I mean, and if you go back to records, you, you know, you got to go, we got to touch on the Sphinx in the Giza Plateau because, you know, you said, and, and I totally agree with you, that it's much older than the pyramids that it sits in front of. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure about the, the Bosnian pyramids. I don't I don't know much about that. I suspect um, that's not what it appears to be. But um, the Sphinx <coughs> is, yeah, that's... Uh, I think there's a real mystery there um, because of the, the erosion. So this this is an idea that's put forward um, you know, quite a few years ago now by well Robert Shock, and he was he was sort of collaborating with uh, like a uh, John, this guy called John Anthony West. Now I don't know much about these mm-hmm. people, but anyway, they came up with this this erosion hypothesis for the Sphinx, and it makes a lot of sense, and there's good evidence for it. You know, I think that the, the Sphinx does appear because of the way, because of, particularly because of the way it's eroded, the particular kinds of erosion patterns. Um, and also, um, you know, Robert Schock, he's a professor of, um, I think it's geology. Uh, and so he, he did measurements of what's known as subsurface erosion in the Sphinx enclosure. And, okay. and from that, he suggested that it shows that the, the Sphinx enclosure was excavated. In other words, they, they removed the rock from the enclosure when the Sphinx was built and designed. Um, it shows that that is thousands of years older than currently we, we think, or the conventional view of the Sphinx is. So there are, there are a couple of lines of evidence, and I talk about this in my book, there are a couple of lines of evidence, uh, erosion evidence and some measurements of well, they've made some measurements of the age of the stonework in the Sphinx Temple. And um, I can go into a bit more detail about that. But combined, there is some good evidence, I think, that the Sphinx is older than it's thought to be. Now, in my view, when I look at the Sphinx, I see, I interpret that you know, as another zodiacal symbol. It's a suggestion. Okay. It, this 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 zodiacal system seems to have been pervasive. You know, it was it was in European cave art. We see it at Quebec Tepe. We see it in other sites, other archaeological sites. Or at least that's my interpretation. We see it at other archaeological sites uh, in the region. We see it in artworks later on in Mesopotamia and in pre-dynastic Egypt. So it seems to me that this system is out there. That it's not just like a, a flash in the pan, you know, it, it was uh-huh. widely dispersed. You look at the Sphinx, and that just looks like another one of these zodiacal symbols. You know, it's, it's representing the feline symbol, which in our system in the ancient zodiac is representing Cancer, or maybe Leo. We don't really know, but um, in, our, in the ancient zodiac, the feline symbol is representing Cancer. And, and the Sphinx is completely anomalous in Egypt. If you, if you look for, is there anything like it, anything else like it? Not at all. There is nothing like the Sphinx whatsoever. So it's completely anomalous. It doesn't seem to fit. The evidence that there suggests it's older, much older than the pyramids, probably thousands, in my view, thousands of years older. Uh, and that actually fits very well with, as I say, Robert Schock's um, measurements of, of subsurface weathering and with the the erosion patterns, and it also fits very well with the zodiacal theory as well, which would suggest that, well, if it's cancer, if the feline symbol is representing cancer, then it suggests that 
the, the Sphinx would have been built around about 7,000 to 6,500 BC, something in that time frame. It is representing well, also, Leo, which is like that, yeah. and it's even earlier. Well, also, though, when Upper and Lower Egypt were, were put together, they said it was put together by the Scorpion King. Could that not necessarily have meant a person, but a zodiacal time frame where the Upper and Lower uh, Egypt were pulled together? Well, that's yes. Yeah, so again, in pre-dynastic times, we do see references to these people that are, well, we, we see references that have been interpreted as people, such as the Scorpion King, but I think there's also like a Crocodile King, and mm-hmm. uh, I think there's like a Bull King as well. So we see these references to animal sort of kings or animal hybrid people. So if you, again, if you put a like a zodiacal interpretation into that, then possibly. Either these, are the, either these are representing pre-dynastic individuals who've been associated with a particular constellation, like, um, like Scorpius, or, or like, you know, so they were around at the time when, say, Scorpius was the spring equinox constellation, that kind of thing. Yeah, or maybe, maybe these carvings, which are interpreted as hieroglyphs, um, are not actually hieroglyphs, or they're not actually describing people, they're describing dates. So, you know, either of those possibilities, I think, is, or either of those could are, are possibilities. So it could be that, you know, the, the, the sort of, some Egyptologists, e- Egyptologists, not all of them, interpret these as people. It could be that they're referring to dates instead, these symbols. Well, dates make more sense to me. I, I mean, because astrology, as you came into the Egyptian time frame, was, was an art. I mean, uh, it was something people studied tremendously. The the wise men were all astrologers um, in in the Bible. Now, I I don't know that, you know, that was actual, but I do know that people called wise men were or or called magicians were actually astrologers who used the stars to um, foretell stuff. Um, I'm not sure when astrology became... um, Astron- ast- I don't know when astronomy became astrology, but somewhere in there, there was a flip over real fast or, or the two branches separated, whichever way it goes. It just seems to me that, that with the hieroglyphs, it would seem that there has to be some sort of um, uh, astrology in some of them. I know they, they have, they've, they've, Theoretically, they they have the alphabet for hieroglyphs, but it seems to me that rather than denoting a time frame by by the rule of a king, uh, a pharaoh, it should be done also according to the zodiac as well. Yeah, so I mean you're absolutely right. The um, you know the uh, the sort of religious beliefs at the time they you know particularly in Egypt and Mesopotamia and probably beyond there we know that they were based on well astrology okay um and like you say what's the difference or, or when did the division between astrology and astronomy happen and i don't know possibly there was always some kind of relationship between them because again you know they they going back a long time, people were looking at the stars, these bad events were happening and so they were kind of associating bad events and, and you know, trying to predict trying to predict when the next one would happen and so then you get this kind of astrological system coming out of the astronomy. Uh-huh. We don't know when that began. We, it's clearly there in ancient Mesopotamia, a few thousand BC. Um, could it be older than that? Well, I guess it could be. Yeah, we don't really know. Because, because for the reasons you say, we don't have a proper writing system that, that tells us exactly what they were doing. <laughs> what, what about the Sumerians? Did they use astrology? Um, astronomy, well, the, did they right, use the astronomy? Is a, yeah, so the Sumerians are one of the earliest uh, groups of people that um, built cities. You know, I think some of the earliest cities that we know about, or what are called cities, often called cities, um, we see in um, Sumer. 
uh, which is at the mm -hmm. sort of the southern part of Iraq in Mesopotamia. Um, so, yeah, I know, and and we know that they had at least some astronomy that's written down in later years by the cultures that followed. So, if, you, if whose whose writing we can read. So some of the later cultures in that region, Babylonians, Akkadians, and so on, we, we can read some of the stuff that they, uh, they wrote. And, and, and in there, we know are some star names, uh, with, and they have Sumerian names to them. So we kind of think that probably the Sumerians... Now, the Sumerians were around 3000 BC. Mm -hmm. We kind of think that they at least, we kind of know at least that the Sumerians were doing astronomy. But of course, we also have the ancient Egyptians, and we know that their entire sort of religious system is based on astronomy. So we know that going back 3000 BC, astronomy was really important to these people, or astrology, call it what you like. Yeah. Um, and, it's, it's really, it's, and that's the sort of beginning of history when we, we have these written records. But so for historians, the, the, the problem in, in sort of. Um, decoding all these animal symbols is that there wasn't nothing's written down before 3000 bc so you have to use other methods to try and understand what all these animal symbols mean before that time and i guess that's where you know that's where i've come into the story with our sort of statistical decoding of the pillars at gebetki tepe and you know they have some of the same animal symbols that we see later on so the bull and, and so on so it probably is all linked you know, going from Gebekli Tepe through down, and, and Gebekli Tepe is located right at the top of these two rivers that, that form the Mesopotamian region. You, know, you go up through Iraq and go through Syria, and you get to southern Turkey, and that's where um, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, and that's where um, Gebekli Tepe is, is more or less located. So it kind of makes sense that you know people would have migrated down these rivers and, and formed these later civilizations with more or less, you know with this astronomical knowledge intact. Hmm. I still can't figure out, and, and you know, hopefully um, archaeologists will be a little faster in, in getting to the rest of the, the site because it just seems to me there's so much information there yet to be uncovered that um, I, I know they... You know, they, they can tell that there are enclosures and stuff like that, but they can't tell if they're pillars or not, can they? No, because they're under the ground. Well, um, no, I don't think they can. I don't think they can see individual pillars with the ground penetrating radar. I'm not sure that they have that resolution. Um, so yeah, we just don't know. We can see these kind of shapes in the radar, these kind of circular enclosure shapes, and, and some sort of a few mm -hmm. other sort of structural shapes, but we don't really know what's down there. We don't know if there are pillars. We don't know if there are symbols on the pillars. So yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting time. <clears throat> now, I, I well, do know... Well, we, when the you, archaeologists, when you've got... I think, said that, that they're going to leave wait, those wait. really important ones till later. I think they're kind of saving those, if you like, for, <laughs> for the years like to dessert. come. When, when, yeah. te when technology improves and they can do an even better investigation of the site. So they're kind of leaving maybe the best till later, which is a bit annoying, a bit frustrating. Well, is it possible that in that 20 acres there is a village of some sort that they just haven't uncovered yet? Or well, are, they, I mean, are, they, um, are they saying it's enclosures like they've already uncovered? I don't think they really know as yet. So um, I think they're pretty much going on what they found already and kind of the suggestion. Well, I, I don't think they're saying uh, concretely what's down there because they just don't know. But, you know, given that we've already uncovered what look like temple-like structures, then perhaps the rest of the site is is similar. I think it's as much but as they know, would. But, but, you know, we are only interpreting this according to our frame of reference. And they may not be what we're thinking. This is this is something that, yeah. that, that gets to me about all of history that that you can only interpret it from from your own wealth of knowledge or, or whatever you think something might be. But 
it could it could totally be something different very much like some in south america some of the uh the pyramids down there um they say they were they were um uh, you know observatories but you don't know for sure and I I know that there's been lots of interpretations about, you know, is there a promenade around this? Was there a reason that this was constructed this way? And it's the same thing with, with Stonehenge. Um, they really don't know what it was for. It's just that we're we're thinking it was a temple. And um, it's, it's like the Great Pyramid when possibly when the people who are descendants of, you know, the Egyptians are descendants of now – came across the Great Pyramid. It was so huge and it was so beautiful. They just assumed it was a temple or a burial place, and they tried to mimic it by, by you know, creating pyramids for burial on their own. And Yeah. Well, the, the archaeologists at the site are careful not to call it a temple because they don't want to be sort of trapped into that, even though, you know, it looks like, you know, it, it's got large-scale architecture, it's got impressive artwork, it's got lots of the things that we would kind of associate with temple-like structures. So, yeah, it's Could not... Could be a it's, library. Right, it's not... Yeah, I mean, something that we've suggested is that it could be an observatory, for instance. Yeah. Probably, probably it was lots of things. You know, it, it, like you say, it's using today's point of reference, it's not just this or just that. Perhaps it was had lots of different functions, part, astro- part observatory, part temple, um a way, well, as, as a temple, I suppose, it'd be a way of communicating historical events and, and, and you know, the, the sort of myths and religions and so on. Well, look look at, you know, when when archaeologists were uncovering some, some of the Roman stuff and they found all of the beautiful tile work and everything, they thought it was, it was you know, a place of worship or whatever, and it turned out to be a, a brothel. So <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, true. I, you do never know. And we, don't, and we don't know what was going on there exactly as well. If you, if you look at um, possibly there were rituals, but we don't really know what they were doing. Back, you know, I suspect they were observing the skies, but what exactly they were looking for, we don't know. So, yeah, there, there is quite a bit of speculation as to the sort of function of you know what people did there. Um. But Have I they discovered think, you know, any with, with bones the, of any sort? Well, not very many. I mean, almost none, considering the, the volume of debris and material and, and sort of fill that was used to fill the site by the people. You know, this is, we're talking 8,000 BC. Massive uh-huh. amount of site, uh, material. Um, yeah, probably, I don't know, what would it say, five to ten meters deep covering many acres of ground. It's a massive amount of stuff. They found almost nothing in terms of human bones. They found plenty of animal bones. So clearly the people there were eating stuff okay. and, and maybe sacrificing stuff. We don't know. Um, but we found, <laughs> to my knowledge, there are a few skull fragments that have been found, and that is pretty much it. To, to the best of my knowledge, things could have changed recently. You always have to be well, careful considering... because, you know, you don't Doing considering right now. they had to, considering they had to dig down so far to get to what was supposedly ground level, to go even be below that even further, you know, would take even further, um, you know, uh, excavation. I would think. I, I, it's it's still such a mystery, and you know that you've been able to link it to so many other cultures and so many other levels of of evolution that uh just just the thought that that many thousands of years ago they understood the progression of the equinoxes is mind mind blowing i mean i i understand it now but i never even heard of it until you know a couple of years ago <laughs> so so uh it, it's an amazing feat that they they understood that, that they obviously had to keep records of some sort in order to see that there was a progression and and figure yes, out, it, I mean, it's a 26,000-year cycle. Yeah. 
and there are no records of yeah, it, so and yet they some... figured it out. Yeah, so this is not something that you you would write, uh, use to write, you know, like today's date. It, 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 you're writing dates with like an accuracy of hundreds of years, perhaps. So, and the fact, you know, this, the fact that they did this shows that for whatever reason, this was important to them. And again, this comes back to this cosmic impact. You know, th these cosmic impacts only happen infrequently. So this is it's a really good way of recording cosmic impacts. But it's not a good way of oh, yeah. recording what happened yesterday or last week. <laughs> so, so maybe yeah, this well. is what it was um, part of what it was used for. But yeah, if you think about precession of the equinoxes, how, how could they have discovered that? Because we tend to think of this as being quite an advanced bit of astronomy. I mean, yeah. the, the sort of standard view, the standard view is that it was um, discovered by Hipparchus of, of the ancient Greeks about 150 B.C., um, whereas we're saying, well, no, maybe it was already known 40,000 years ago. So how could they know that? Well, if you're already looking at the stars and sort of keeping track of the seasons, then over a person's lifetime, you would see an amount of precession equal to about two times the width of the moon. Okay, so over about 30 years or 35 years, you would see an amount of procession equal to one width of the moon. So if you were if you were observing the stars carefully and recording the equinoxes, the the, the the position of the sun on the equinoxes and the solstices, provided you did that for about thirty years, you probably would notice this processional effect. Yeah, but so, their lifespan no, wasn't that long. Was, well, yeah, but it was probably more than thirty years, you know, you know on a good day for a good life, you could <laughs> 30 years. So, so I, I don't think you know, it's certainly not impossible that for them to notice this. This is something that's definitely within their within their reach. These ancient people. Well, somebody somebody did, and they passed it down because um, it's clearly there. Uh, I just noticed the time. Mark Marcus just reminded me that that I um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for just such a really wonderful two hours and um tell everybody that if you want to if you want to find out more about him and, and listen to more of his stuff martin sweetman sweat sweatman i don't know why i want to make you sweet but sweatman um <laughs> yep. dot blogspot dot com and and you can find a whole bunch of his material and his papers and 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 his book i mean it 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 was just Enlightening is is blue blazes, and of course, um, pre prehistory decoded will answer a lot of questions, but but will create many many more. And I thank you so much for being with us today. I just so appreciate all the work you've done, and and will continue to do, and possibly answer some more questions down the road a little bit more. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, thank you very much, Barbara, for for having me on your show. Enjoyed it. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I want to sign off here before they cut me off, but I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to remind you that this will be up on the YouTube channel, and if you like what you hear, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can find it on my website, barbaradelong.com. And um, let us know you're out there, because by subscribing, that's the only way we know you're listening, and it gives us uh, encouragement to keep keep on trucking and doing what we're doing and sending you out there fabulous information like today's show. Have a great one, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>